Well, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, good afternoon, admirals, generals, some senior executives, corporate executives, industry partners, international partners, and Sea, Air, and Space Exposition 2022 attendees. Thank you for attending this event, Space, the Next Warfighting Domain. My name is Rear Admiral Jim Butler, U.S. Navy retired. I have a career in the Navy's information warfare community, which includes space. I will be your moder moderator of what promises to be a great panel consisting of space leaders and experts from the Navy and Marine Corps and industry partners, Microsoft and Electromechanical Mecha Systems, CAES. Before I introduce our panel members, I want to offer a special thank you for our Navy lead coordinator, Ms. Julia Simpson, and the rest of her team. We have four excellent panel members for our discussion on space warfare today. Dr. Angel Smith has a bachelor's in social, so, social psychology, master's in information relations and affairs, master's in philosophy, and a PhD in organizational psychology. She currently serves as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. She started her career in the U.S. Marine Corps as a KC-130 pilot for 23 years. She continued her service as a senior professional staff member in the U.S. House of Representatives, where she served as the chairman's lead for budgetary and programmatic oversight of the $21 billion military intelligence program. She also served as the staff lead for the Committee on DOD Software Movement, including AI and cloud. Her industry career has included leading legislative and policy coordination for Microsoft, serving as president of advanced payloads and deliverables at Meta Special Aerospace, and most re recently as a partner of Microsoft's mission solutions and customers expan customer expansion team. Commander Damon Melodosian is a native of Rhode Island. He earned his Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice from o Rhode Island College and a Master of Arts degree from John Hopkins. Damon earned a commission through the Officer Kansas School in 2000 and became an intelligence officer in the information warfare community. Across his 22 years, his assignments include an intelligence officer aboard the USS Bella Wood, multiple intelligence roles within US Indo-PACOM's J2 and Joint Intelligence Center Pacific, a strategic debriefer for field operating base in Naples, Italy, multiple roles at the Navy Expeditionary Intelligence Command, and an, an assistant American legation, United States Naval Attaché, U.S. Defense Attaché office in Tel Aviv. He has also served tours in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Commander Melodosian is currently assigned to the Space Development Agency in the emergency, Emerging cap, Emergent Capability Cell. Mr. Greg Bell earned his executive MBA from the University of Tennessee and graduated from Loyola University of Maryland with a BS in Engineering Sciences. He is an experienced president and CEO, COO, and senior program director serving in large and small businesses in the space, defense, and commercial markets. Currently, Greg is the Space Systems Division Vice President of Electromechanical Systems within Cobham Advanced Electronic Solutions. Their space product portfolio includes radiation-hardened microelectronics, application-specific integrated circuits, and advanced packaging solutions. Prior to joining CAES, Greg served as COO of ClearAlign, a leading provider in electro-optical components and systems, including imaging across the UV through the long-wave IR portions of the spectrum. Prior to ClearAlign, Greg served as the president and CEO for Photonis USA, responsible for U.S. operations, including defense, and night vision systems business units. Greg was also the president and general manager, manager for L3 Electro-Optical Systems, a world leader in development of night vision technology and electro-optical systems. And finally, Major General Ryan Heritage graduated from George Washington University here in DC. and was commissioned through the Navy Reserve Officer Training Corps program. He is also a graduate of the Army War College, Harvard Business School, uh, Harvard Business School Advanced Management Program. He is an infantry officer by trade who has served multiple tours with the 3rd Battalion and as commanding officer for the 6th Marine Regiment. He has also served as the current operations officer 
with the second MEF forward in Iraq, future operations for the second Marine Division at Camp Lejeune, current operations officer for third MEF in Okinawa, and then the Deputy Commander Marine Forces Cyberspace Command at Fort Meade, Maryland. His joint assignments include Future Ops Planner at U.S. Southern Command and Deputy Director for Future Operations in the J-3 U.S. Cyber Command. General Heritage is currently assigned as Commander, Marine Corps Forces Cyberspace Command and Marine Corps Forces Space Command. So today we have a series of questions to bring out industry and military perspectives on space warfare and then we'll open up, open up to the audience. So when you're ready to answer, ask a question, uh, please raise your hand and one of the Navy League staff members will bring you a microphone. Crucial to our national defense, space is quickly gaining prominence as another warfighting domain in addition to land, air, and sea. What will the future of warfighting look like as all nations race to conquer this new military high ground? So a series of questions, starting with Mr. Bell. Mr. Bell, what do you see as the space equipment industry way ahead in space warfare? Thanks, Jim. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank the Navy League for inviting me to be a panelist uh, to serve on uh, such an important topic. Um, Case is proud to serve the Navy as a Tier 4 to a Tier 1 supplier. Uh, we provide products that are underwater, uh, on the sea, uh, on land, uh, in air, and, and obviously in space. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Cobham Advanced Electronic Solutions, we are a leading technology provider uh, for many of the world's most critical missions. Our RF, uh, microwave and millimeter technologies, um, serve many of uh, critical missions. Our communication satellites keep us uh, connected. Uh, we, uh, we're also, uh, sorry, uh, we, we, our, our radiation hardened microelectronics uh, empower uh, the world's uh, most important spacecraft. Uh, so we serve from communication uh, satellites, from Earth observation uh, satellites, uh, from uh, manned space, uh, as well as um, the critical mission uh, military, uh, well, the critical military missions. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, we also, uh, we have uh, several, uh, we serve several of the latest cons constellations. Uh, so, but to your question specifically about uh, space equipment uh, in, in the industry, the way ahead, uh, the way that we see it at, at CASE, it's, it's about, um, it's, it's, it's definitely about situational awareness. Uh, and with that situational awareness, uh, what, we're, what we want to be able to do is reduce cycle times and accelerate technology development. And how we do that at CASE is through strategic partnerships because uh, we don't have to do this alone. Uh, secondly, we want to make sure that we protect the U.S. supply base. So uh, from a strategic partnership, uh, recently we, we announced a, um, a partnership with Skywater. Uh, Skywater is a U.S.-based foundry that will provide American semiconductors. We also have a partnership with Lattice Semiconductors where we will bring uh, radiation-hardened um, electronics uh, packaging to focal uh, to FPGAs, which is going to be critical for learning uh, in space. Also, more, most recently, we announced a strategic partnership with Trident Systems. Uh, while that's important is that they're a leader in digital signal processing. And when you combine the capabilities of our radiation-hardened uh, microelectronics with their advanced digital signal processing, we'll be able to further advance some of the world's most critical missions. And we also did an acquisition in 2021 of uh, Colorado Engineering. Uh, that was some of the brightest minds in, uh, of scientists and engineers in Colorado Springs. And what they're able to do is add to our portfolio artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, dear to my heart, uh, in, in Exeter, New Hampshire, is the partnership that we have with Swiss to 12. Swiss to 12 is an additive manufacturing uh, company that we're bringing their their space technology for additive uh, manufacturing or 3D printing, 
to the, to the United States. Um, so while they're qualifying, you know, they've been qualified in, in uh, to the European Space Agency, we'll be qualifying them to the NASA requirements. But why that's so important to uh, reduce costs and accelerate uh, technology development is that recently we received a spec and, for, and it was for a five channel high power RF combiner. And from the time receiving the spec to the time that we were able to deliver the product was 10 weeks. And a normal manufacturing process, it would have taken us over 10 months just to manufacture it. But we were able to take the design by eliminating a lot of the, the parts through additive manufacturing. We were able to do then the uh, integration, the test, uh, and ship the product within in 10 weeks. And then critical is, is our supply chain. We must have onshore foundries. Um, Definitely, as, as we're looking at that, we're, we continue to, we can ask for congressional support uh, with Skywater so that we can further advance that. But I think if COVID taught us anything is that if we're going to rely on the West to provide uh, all of our semiconductors and, and their, our foundry solution, uh, then we're always going to be left behind. So we need to have that capability. And we also need to be able to identify down to those rare earth elements as well because we have critical foams uh, that are, serve many of the Navy missions uh, for, for our radar systems, whether they uh, have electrical properties or medical properties. Uh, but when you don't have access to those rare earth elements, then it's a long requalification process. So in, in summary, it's uh, we need to advance our technology uh, development through strategic partnerships, and we need to ensure that we have onshore foundries. Okay, thanks, Greg. Commander. What is the SDA way ahead in space warfare? So how do we reduce the latency time between a sensor identifying a threat to a ship and that ship being able to shoot on that target? How do we close the kill chain to between the time that sensor is detected to the time that target is destroyed in single digit seconds? That is the challenge that SDA has taken on to proliferate a low earth um, orbit constellation called the NDSA, National Defense Space Architecture, to do that exact mission. Um, so we're gonna do that in a number of ways. Uh, first and foremost, it's working with our DOD partners, uh, the combatant commands, the services, the interagency partners, and most importantly, I think, uh, our, our agency, our, the commercial market that's actually, as you'll see uh, throughout uh, my talking points, is kind of the genesis of getting what we're putting on orbit uh, to defend the United States and our allies to quick as possible. So what is the NDSA and how are we going to proliferate this uh, low orb orbit uh, constellation of satellites to, um, to actually reduce that latency uh, as I described to single digit seconds. So the architecture we're building is done in layers. Um, a transport layer, a tracking layer, a custody layer, and then different layers of satellites, uh, processors, sensors, all to build out this architecture. Um, the backbone uh, of our, uh, the NDSA and our first layers is the, uh, the transport uh, satellite architecture. So it it's, um, constitutes uh, initially 20 satellites in low Earth orbit through our first tranche and subsequent tranches proliferating out to that to 126 by 2024 and then so on throughout the end of the decade and beyond. And what those satellites are gonna do is provide um, speed of light uh, uh, data transfer from anywhere on the planet to uh, any, any war fighting element, whether it's a carrier strike group, uh, a carrier air wing, a DDG um, operating independently in the name your body of ocean, a Marine Corps ground unit, a long range fires unit, operating anywhere on the planet, we can get that data there as quick as possible during our uh, on-orbit satellite links, optical satellite links, sending it down through link 16, uh, KA bands or optical links down to the ground. Uh, the other layer that we have that's crucial to this, uh, given the recent press with hypersonics, is our tracking layer, which was just funded for our, for, uh, uh, through um, beginning in 2025. Our first uh, operational uh, um, layer, uh, tracking layer will uh, be on orbit. Um, it'll be 28 satellites, uh, soon to be uh, we just released the uh, contracts uh, uh, proposals for that, so we should be seeing contracts come in pretty soon 
to, uh, for the vendors and the industry to help us proliferate uh, that architecture. So what the tracking layer is going to do is it's going to be able to do uh, right of launch uh, tracking hypersonic missiles, advanced ballistic missiles, any advanced missile uh, fired from an adversary's um, sea, air, or uh, land-based, be able to track that on orbit, send that data through that transport layer I just identified, and then ultimately down to a uh, fusion cell, a targeting cell, and ultimately to that shooter, that weapon system that will knock it out of the sky before it impacts uh, a, a, friendly, a friendly target or a friendly population, a military installation or base, uh, or a carrier strike group. So that is how we're actually going to proliferate a defensive uh, measure throughout the space architecture to actually fight that battle and help our uh, allies and our services fight that battle in any body of water and on land throughout the, uh, throughout the Earth. We're doing that by a very different business model from how uh, it's normally done in the Department of Defense. We're focusing on making sure we get satellites on orbit, on time, on schedule as a top priority working with the budget we have, and ultimately giving the warfighters the capability they need um, to actually perforate, to actually conduct those operations, and then continuing that on. Every two years, we'll be putting up satellites in the hundreds, um, transport satellites and tracking satellites, as well as building out the architecture and the algorithms, the, uh, the software and the hardware to proliferate that uh, throughout uh, the end of the decade and beyond. So right now, I'll leave you with this, is our first uh, tranche, tranche zero, our demonstration tranche, which is where we get the warfighters to uh, you know, play with the system, see how it works, so they can build it into the battle plans for our first and second tranches as we proliferate throughout the decade, every two years. Uh, tranche one will one be launched in 2024. That's be 126 uh, track, uh, transport satellites and 28 tracking satellites, and then so on throughout the decade and beyond, every two years, proliferating an architecture, putting hundreds of proliferated low Earth orbit satellites, providing a persistent coverage of the globe by the end of the decade uh, uh, through hundreds of satellites working in a mesh network. And then that's where we bring in other uh, end nodes, other different satellites, as well as commercial market satellites to hopefully help proliferate a uh, defense architecture and move data swiftly throughout the, uh, the globe. And ultimately to the warfighter that actually has to uh, pull the trigger or press the button to go uh, defend the United States. Okay, great answer. Thanks, Damon. Dr. Smith, what do you see as the software industry way ahead in space warfare? Um, well, I'd say anywhere that you've got multi-domain operations, um, you've got large data sets, large disparate data sets don't, that don't necessarily easily mesh together. You need to move, move, uh, you need to move data fast, and you need to make decisions very, very quickly. Um, that's the place where I think that the software in, uh, software uh, industry is actually uniquely postured to be able to support. Um, I'd say if we've learned one thing, um, we owe Nextbox, right? So if you want to figure out how to make uh, an entire globe full of a 16 year and under uh, people really, really angry, you mess around with latency whenever they're playing Call of Duty, and uh, you make it very difficult for them to, you give them one second worth of la latency problems and all of a sudden you've, your world is quite, quite, you know, falling apart. Um, if we were to take just that same mindset and apply that, some of the, those same commercial learnings to our uh, military individuals across the globe, I think it would be a serious game changer in the way that we make decisions all the way from the tactical level to the strategic level. Great, thank you. General Heritage, what do you see as the Marine Corps way ahead in space warfare? I thought you were gonna ask me a different question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, first, Jim and uh, Neely, thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to be here today and, and, and talk a little bit about uh, the Marine Corps and, and Mar Four Space. Um, so I, I would start with there's probably two uh, uh, guiding concepts uh, out there: um, directiveness, force design, 2030. Mm -hmm. uh, that talks about the modernization of the Marine Corps, the lethality, um, and some of the you know divestiture, divestiture uh, so that we can take that and reinvest it in in, uh, in many of the capabilities that, that the panelists talked about today. And the other one is the stand-in force concept. Um, which the commander, I think, hit upon or alluded to when you talk about uh, a MEF or a MU or an ARG, some sort of MAGTAF, you know, sitting inside a uh, weapons engagement zone of an, of an adversary. So those are our two aiming points. Um, as I look at port, you know, it, it's been a deliberate effort across the Marine Corps. Uh, for those familiar with the .MLPF 
uh, acronym. Um, please don't go back 20 or 30 years like myself and think that's, that's a process that's you know, going to take three, four, or five years to, to flush out because it's not. And it's just tied to the Commandant's force design, the necessity to modernize. So if I look just from a doctrinal perspective and I quickly walk through it, you look at how the Marine Corps is rewriting some of its doctrine as it relates to space and fires and integrating all of the, those capabilities, how we're nested with Space Force, um, how we're nested with the U.S. Space Commons track comment, and updating the policies, whether it's for space control or space doctrine, as I mentioned in the Marine Corps. Organization, uh, you know, what changes have we made? You have to look no further than really MarFor Cyber, which in July of 21 became MarFor Cyber, MarFor Space. So a quick reorganization there. And there's something more than just to acknowledge the importance of the criticality of space, but it's how we support the fleet, how we support the joint force in the fight, and then, you know, how is wearing two hats? How do we converge those capabilities and authorities under one again to support the warfighter? Uh, forward. From a training perspective, you know, the Marine Corps is stepping out, uh, changing some of the training for our space uh, staff officers, uh, doubling down on the uh, space operations officers out at Naval Postgraduate School, which produces an incredible product. Uh, training in the field, training across the field. I mean, what we're doing at the MAGTAF integrated exercises, warfighting exercises out of 29 Palms, are night and day to, to what I did, went through and experienced as a, as a lieutenant captain or even as a regimental commander. And again, again, integrating all of those capabilities, going back to the training. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to walk quickly into a group of officers from all the services and civilians who were there from Expeditionary Warfare School, and they were up at Mar Force Cyber before it came down, and they were talking about, you know, how do you integrate capabilities at the company and battalion level? And they're talking about authorities and, and speed and the importance of data and the transport layers. Those are things we were not talking about 20 years ago, but are absolutely required uh, today. Material, you know, we can talk about capability development. You know, typically you don't associate, you know, Marines and space necessarily, but that capability is being moved forward through all the exercises that are ongoing at the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, tied to our capability development director, and obviously Mark Corsiscom would be critical in the foundation there. Um, on the personnel, you know, well, this personnel are coming. Um, this isn't, again, this is a comprehensive look across the Marine Corps. There's new MOSs, Marine Occupational Specialties, Military Occupational Specialties that have been created, uh, whether it's from influence, space, or cyber, and they're being resourced uh, accordingly. And then on the leadership side, very similarly, you know, we're creating um, team leaders for Marine, uh, uh, Marine Space Support Teams, um, leaders at all echelons being educated both on, on cyber and space. So we're all in, and as a Naval Expeditionary Force, you know, you need somebody to be in, inside the footprint uh, of a satellite, and, you know, that's, that's something that, that we're accustomed to doing. And so we're, we're all in, and that's our, sort of a summary of how we're getting into it. All right, great answers, thank you. So to set up the next question, the space industry can be generally grouped into three sectors, commercial, which includes goods and services, broadcast, SATCOM, tourism, et cetera, civil, science and weather, and then national security, which is, includes defense and intelligence. So for our industry panelists with commercial experience, when it comes to warfare and space, what can the military learn from the commercial industry to assure positive outcomes in a military conflict? I'm, I'm happy to jump on this one first. Um, so when I first left the Marine Corps, it was really, um, can I also address the fact that General Heritage and I both have the high, high ground over here, and so you're all surrounded. Uh, um, elephant in the room, I just make sure you guys know we've got it under control. Um, so when I first left the Marine Corps, though, um, we, I, it was, you know, you get used to doing things a very specific way, and sometimes you don't necessarily think outside the box or think about um, what's in the realm of possible. Uh, when I first retired, I went over to Capitol Hill, and it was the first time I had really had any experience working with industry because they were lobbying me, and they were constantly coming in saying, hey, this is what we've got, this is what we do. Um, and admittedly, I kept thinking to myself, like, holy cow, we need that. Holy cow, we need that in the military. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we don't know that they don't have that in the military. And I kept being just bombarded by so many different really incredible innovations and technologies that I had no idea existed um, whenever I was act when I was in the Marine Corps, and I, I flew uh, C-130s, which is God's chariot, the sexiest airplane in the uh, DOD's inventory. So you can all imagine that was probably on the front side of all innovation, right? Um, but with that being said, I'd say the one thing that commercial can do is just let you know what's in the realm of possible. 
a lot of times when we engage with um, our DOD uh, and IC counterparts, we walk into the room, the first thing we'll just say is, tell us your problem. Um, because you'll have, you know, a lot of my, one of my old bosses used to call them hippie patriots. We've got a lot of, you know, these uh, software data scientists that are really just like super, super eager to understand your problem because I guarantee you they're going to come to the table with a solution that you're probably not considering. Um, so that would be the, the first thing. And then I think the second thing is that because commercial companies deal in profit and loss, uh, we're always, always, always looking for ways to actually make things happen more efficiently. And I'm always reflecting on the fact that, you know, whenever I was in the Marine Corps, we, I flew a, a harvest hawk for a little while, and we had a, a cobra uh, ball on the wing of the aircraft. And if we were doing any type of collection, we would literally live stream the whole thing straight down to the ground. I mean, whether it was good data or bad data, we were constantly, like, streaming everything we possibly can. Um, as you can imagine, that's not necessarily always super helpful. Um, you know, and I bring up Xbox a little bit in jest. But the way that you move data super, super fast whenever you're trying to service global customers is you have to th think about efficient ways and you're only passing the most important pieces of information at the time that you absolutely need that. Um, as sensors continue to get better and they get better integrated and we are starting to see such a huge variety of different types of data sets that are coming in, you know, we're, we're looking at synthetic aperture radar, we're bringing in LIDAR data, signals intelligence data, EOIR data, all of these things are incredibly important to the warfighter, but they're very, very voluminous. And a lot of times, if we are doing a collection and you're only looking at probably one to five percent of all of that data, then why are, we need to be smarter about how we're moving it around. Um, and that's when you start to think about multi-domain operations. Um, you know, we're in the business of ones and zeros, right? So we're looking at ways that we can move, you know, rather than just fiber, can we move, can we move data through satellites? Can we go from LEO to MEO, back down to LEO, then down to a ground station? How can we be faster with our ground stations? How can we use our underwater data centers to be able to process data more rapidly? So we're constantly looking at different ways to be able to do things more efficiently. And I think that that's in this particular, as warfare is starting to transform into a place that is um, sometimes kinetics aren't necessarily the thing that's gonna tip the scale. We have to start to really look at ways that we are going to fight in, um, I think, the battle space that our adversaries have chosen to fight in. Great. Can I jump on? Uh, sure. Thank you, Angel. I'm, if I can just maybe add. Yeah. Uh, go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, if I wanted to add a little bit. Yeah, I don't know that we have the best military in the world, so I don't really know what they can learn from us. And I've kind of been threatened that I got two Marines on each side, so <laughs> I'm going to go uh, tread here uh, lightly. But uh, I, I think that you know, it's it's definitely when we look when we look at it, we need desegregation. You know, when you look at like um, 648 satellites for, for one web, you know, you need that, that de desegregation of data so that, that, you can't, uh, that you can't be just taken out by one, one uh, orbit or, or uh, one set of satellites, uh, but more practical. I think what the military could continue to learn from industry would be product standardization, a continued focus on swap C, and then also generational uprevving. Um, you know, I think when you look at companies like Airbus and they've been able to, I think they're now on, uh, using commercial techniques, they're now on their bus structures like Gen 6. Uh, and, and they've been able to do that by uh, making it affordable uh, and also adding new feature sets each time. And we're going to be able to do that with additive manufacturing as we start to 3D print uh, more things uh, as well. I think the other thing that, that the commercial industry does really well is bundling. Uh, so we know how to bundle, uh, and I really give acquisition reform uh, a thumbs up for the fact that they now allow commerciality uh, of like products uh, for, for contracts because that helps speed the whole uh, acquisition process as well. And I think as we start to look at like um, what uh, Microsoft's doing and others are doing in, in AI and machine learning, uh, we're going to be able to incorporate, incorporate those much faster uh, as well. Great. So I was just going to jump on Angel's point is just on, on the training because you talked about how do you transition from Leo to, to Mio and then the data and then knowing what data you need at what time. I mean, we need to be able to exercise and train to that. Yeah. So again, I'll go back to sort of the dot MLPF. This isn't something that we can take two years to learn about. This has to be you know, real time learning and exercising and then back to the capability development and then bring in fielding those fixes as quick as possible. So I like that analogy. I, all I kept thinking about is, you know, how does a, how does a team out at 29 Palms 
work through that at the battalion or, or you know, MAGTAP and U level. So they're really and good. Training globally too. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, we used to just think about training in the Marine Corps, training the Army, training the Air Force. Now we must train as an entire organization with all of our civilian counterparts. And oh, by the way, all the other nations across the globe that also need to integrate with us because of the threats. Yeah, and distribute it, right? Yeah. So not and only globally. I mean, you're, yeah, as yeah. you mentioned, disaggregation of data. Right. All I kept thinking about is distributed forces. Yeah. Right. All over. So, sorry. Great. No, good answers. So, for our military panelists, what can uh, commercial and de defense industry partners learn from the DoD military to ensure minimal impact and/or survival of their systems from a warfare perspective in space? I said, um, resiliency. I think that'd be the first, and I think uh, both of you already touched upon it. Is uh, it, you know, when when industry is delivering something, it's got to be resilient right off. Taking the time for us to add that additional resiliency is, is something we continue uh, to get better at. Um, platform agnostic. Uh, the uh, you know one delivering uh, uh, one one platform that only does one thing. Uh, we need something that supports all warfighting functions in the worst environments, and as you all both already have mentioned, um, those would be three things that top jump to the top of my. Okay, Jamie. Yeah, I think uh, I think the general hit a really good point, as well as uh, um, you, you both. Uh, resiliency is 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 critical. I'm looking at how SDA is uh, building on our architecture uh, with two years. It's small satellites. Uh, that have to be proliferated every two years. So how do you do that uh, given the, the bureaucracy normally associated with the government and with the Department of Defense? You have to leverage uh, industry's uh, innovation um, in addition to the resiliency on how to keep those satellites functioning and then keep those satellites um, um, progressing in their capabilities every few years. So they stay competitively in a business environment. We need to stay competitive in an operational and national defense environment. So SDA is not focused on like reinventing the wheel. We're focusing on how do we leverage uh, industries, um, small satellite uh, building capability, their launch capabilities, their, uh, those, their algorithms, their hardware and software uh, that they're putting into their satellites that we can use ours focusing mainly on a commoditized um, uh, commercial uh, architecture, commoditized pr commercial buses. These are not exclusive satellites we're looking at. We're looking at small sats able to peripherate quickly within you know, uh, two years. And, and you know, given uh, how our timeline looks, it's less than that, you know, 120 days from on average between the time we put out a request for proposal till they, we have a uh, a, uh, a private company or industry on contract to build it and it has to go up. So we need as the, the SDA and the government to figure out how can we make things on our end faster to support you guys, industry, putting those satellites for us on orbit quickly. And I think resiliency is a key and I think uh, the innovation that uh, we're challenging uh, our industry partners to build stuff for us fast. And I think it's something that we, I don't think the government can do at the pace that industry does and definitely at the pace at uh, what SDA is achieving to do, uh, we always say we're sempersidious, means always faster. Uh, the only way we can be fast is if we learn from industry. Great, great answers. So for any panelist, uh, across the three sectors, commercial, civil, and national security, where's the line in the sand in warfare engagement across these three sectors? And what should we do differently to defend these three sectors? Well, I'll take that one. I'm going to defer the lion to drawing a line in the sand. <laughs> I'll leave that for the policymakers um, to, to handle that one. But I would go back, um, whether you call it resiliency or, or security, that, that would be the, the one area I think we can, um, we could probably close some scenes and gaps. And, and from, a, I'll put my sort of cyber hat on, is whether it's, you know, the, the small um, mom and pop uh, uh, company uh, working out of a garage, which is fantastic, and we all need to leverage all the way up to the largest industry is uh, or companies. Where is that cybersecurity um, uh, uh, really coverage? Um, what's the coordination that happens between private uh, and DoD on that cybersecurity, ensuring you know not only supply chain, but then once that uh, capability is fielded, uh, you know there's a there's a requirement. I th still think on us in DoD industry or industry really large to maintain that and protect it, so that'd be one area. 
Great. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to add on to that too. Um, if there's one thing that we've noticed over the last you know, few years that our adversaries have absolutely uh, muddied the water on where combat zones actually exist. Um, and so if we learned anything even from like the colonial pipeline phenomenon, um, what does operational preparation the environment look like anymore? You know, is, 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 is OPE, when you've got adversaries that are starting to mess with your power grids, starting to figure out how they can mess with your fuel systems, um, what does that actually look like? And, and unfortunately, um, the enemy gets a vote, um, and they've, I think, very, very clearly identified that anything that would affect us and our stability inside our nation or any of our partner nations across the globe is 100% fair game. And the only way that we can get over that is by making sure that we are ridiculously integrated. I mean, 100% integrated. We know your problems, you know our solutions. Um, and we're, that's just the only way that we're gonna be able to get there is by really, really good, uh, consistent, uh, consistent communication. Okay, I think that question really talks, you know, so if you flip the question on its head, a lot about situational awareness. Yeah. Right? Having the indication and warning, whether it's in space or cyber, in, in any domain, right? You want that indication and war, uh, warning. We sort of talked about it in the, in the um, you know, before we came out here, is this idea of zero trust. I mean, you don't, you don't trust your network anyway, right? I mean, you, ha you, can't, you have to have confidence in it, yeah. but from a trust perspective, there's all sorts of things that, again, both of us can get after. Yeah, I totally agree. Great answers. So to set up the next question, Space architecture can be gener generally defined as the launch segment, space segment, ground segment, and sometimes a user segment defining data and services beyond the ground segment, telemetry, com command and control. So for our industry partners, across any of the segments, how does commercial industry prepare and train, prepare and train to defend their systems for warfare across the space, ground, or user segments? Um, at case, that's an interesting question because I'm not really sure in the way uh, that we manufacture that we do it differently for, for any of those sectors. We're really using the same uh, technologies uh, for all of them. So I think that what it really comes down to then is the survivability and the protectability of the data and how we're going to do that, you know, through uh, redundancy and steerability and frequency agility. I don't know. Uh, how we're going to do that, and then I, I think though, but if I was, if I were to sum it up all in, in one word, I would, I would probably say interoperability. You know, across of uh, across those three uh, domains, you really have to have interoperability, and I think a great example of that uh, for industry uh, to follow is what the military has done with the MUO system. Mm -hmm. You know, so with that mobile user objective system, you know, for that uh, UHF uh, narrow band system that's controlled by the by the Marine Corps. Uh, that's a great example how, you know, it's used by the Air Force and the Army and the Marine Corps uh, and the Navy uh, and ha how all of that's uh, integrated together, I think, so that can really serve as uh, a lesson for us to learn in industry is that interoperability across the three domains. Great. Um, we, this is one of those really funny areas that I feel like we've had a little bit of an advantage for the last you know, two decades or so because we've literally been under attack, as at least on the Microsoft side, for decades now. Um, when, you, when you operate the largest productivity suite across the entire planet, um, you, we, we, we see trillions of signals every single day of attempts to penetrate the, all of the different, uh, different areas that we have inside of our, inside of our productivity suite in our cloud. Um, and one of the things that we've actually seen is, you know, if you go back to the early 2000s, um, we had a less sophisticated opponent. Um, they, most of the time, they were maybe looking, like, trying to hustle a little bit of cash from some of the users and maybe just, you know, a little mischievous uh, to what it's actually developed to, you know, now in the, you know, the 2020s. Um, and that is a nation state adversary. It's a uh, activist adversary, it is a terrorist adversary, it's a mischievous 16-year-old eating Cheetos in his mom's basement adversary. Um, they're all over the place, um, very, 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 very wide swath. And these are incredibly well-funded, very, very sophisticated and incredibly motivated opponents that we now face these days. 
Um, and uh, they're just as complicated as the, the variety of the opponent that we have that's constantly trying to penetrate, pre penetrate the system. It's what motivates them. Some of them are politically motivated. Some of them are just angry because they're mad about what Russia is doing. Um, some of them are just trying to uh, you know, take money away from a large entity that they know that they haven't been doing the security fabric uh, properly. And so um, a lot of that uh, that we're starting to see right now is that the enemy has gotten much broader. Um, they're much more specific in their targets, but at the same time, they've also opened the aperture on what they would consider a target to actually be um, because they know that the integration between commercial and defense is a must, and so the target set has absolutely changed in a lot of ways. And um, General, I'll tell you, I, we completely foot stomp when you talk about uh, essentially having you know, agnostic systems. Um, I would say that that's one of the greatest benefits of having a cloud agnostic system also, is that you have now given your adversary a targeting problem. Uh, by putting it all in one cloud, all you're doing is you're, you're, make, you're making it more simple for them to be able to focus in on the issues and the areas that they need to be focused on. And as we start to move to the satellite, um, satellite space, it's going to become even more important, especially considering the dependencies that most of the systems we operate on have on satellite, satellite infrastructure. Great. So for our military panelists, same question. What can the military learn from the commercial space industry? Should we get into a fight in the space, ground, or user segments? Um, uh, scalability, I think, is, is one. Um, uh, obviously, the resiliency, um, I think that's tied in the scalability. The, the rapid prototyping um, is another one, uh, something that is a necessity for us. Uh, the innovation, um, you know, the, just uh, the, the, frame, the, the thought uh, that goes into it, the investment that goes into innovation is absolutely uh, critical. The, um, the culture sort of fail fast, which I like to think uh, we, we have sort of removed some of those bars from our, the way we train. Um, and you know, again, whether it's in 29 Palms or on a deployment, having the opportunity to learn those lessons and then apply those lessons uh, immediately is, is what we need. So I gotta leave it there. Great. So I would add to that um, how industry utilizes uh, supply chain um, issues. Um, I mean, recently we've been all understanding that the global supply chain has affected everything from uh, Department of Defense to uh, new cars. So how, um, how is industry working to affect and be able to get satellites in technology in a competitive environment, uh, in a, a cutthroat competitive environment in, in some cases? How are they using, uh, you know, leveraging uh, um, gaps or challenges with supply chain issues globally to be able to remain competitive and able to get uh, satellites, the hardware and software on orbit. And that's something I think as uh, SDA definitely could use given uh, the pace that we're working at as well as the Department of Defense and uh, particularly focus on space where it's a lot of technology, everything you mentioned like rare earth metals, how do you get it from uh, its infancy or the nascent stage of it's uh, just an idea to we need this metal to be ored and to refine and then ultimately put it in on a satellite. Um, I think that's something that the uh, Department of Defense, particularly uh, the military and definitely SDA, would need to look at, be able to leverage to get uh, satellites up as quick as possible. Okay, great answers. So for any panelist, uh, in the world of cyber, our adversaries, nation state actors and criminals, appear to operate or attempt to operate on our soil and on our equipment without fear of retribu retribution. How do we prevent this from occurring in space or across the space architecture? Try to, try to answer without getting into deterrence, deterrence theory. Um, well, first is, is, I'll start with attribution. Uh, that's hard. Right. Attribution in, in cyber, as you know, is hard. So to say that they're operating on our, on our terrain um, in our homeland, that's, that's a whole uh, different issue. Um, but there is, you know, the, as General Nakasone would say, is, uh, you know, this idea of uh, forward presence, this idea of hunting forward, um, this idea of competing, mm -hmm. uh, I think from a cyber perspective is something that we have to continue to do. And, uh, and, and we have the authorities um, and we have the necessity to do that. Uh, so you, you have to compete. And then I'll, I'll really, I think I'll anchor back in on the, the sort of cyber security aspect of it. Uh, again, it starts at, at the really in concept design, you know, and, and holding uh, folks accountable 
for the security uh, of, of the data um, as it moves from concept to, to fielding is absolutely uh, critical. And then when it is a space capability that's, that's fielded, you know, even as uh, MAR4 Cyber, and we talk about our cyber protection teams, I mean, that is a mission uh, that they're prepared to do is, is, is get on those networks and, and defend, uh, you know, either remotely or forward wherever we need to. Great, thanks. Okay. I'd say it's also, in some ways, it starts with a healthy appreciation for what the threat actually is, which if I was to give one complaint back as the, uh, the from on the cyber, the, the cyberspace on the Microsoft side, sometimes we only know the threat based off of the threats that we actually see. And um, I think that there's sometimes some, some good synergies between the threat that we see or perceive, the threats that the Department of Defense and the intelligence community actually sees, that sometimes the synergies between those two things just never overlap. And um, you know, if we're going to get resilient everywhere we, we plan to operate, we need to make sure that we're synergizing the threats and then making sure that we're putting in place um, cyber protections that are actionable at every single, within every single domain. Great. So now we'd like to open it up to the audience for any questions. Uh, if you have a question, if you uh, raise your hand and one of the Navy League staffers will bring you a uh, microphone. There we go. No takers yet. Oh, there we go. Back over there. Um, hello, I'm Anindatha Mukherjee from the Naval Surface Warfare Center. This has a little bit less to do with the defense of space, but more um, like the maintenance of our space environment. So you were talking about deploying multiple satellites and in increasing quantity over the years, but what happens at the end of their life cycle? Do you have any plans for deorbiting them and clearing up the space clutter? because uh, a lot of junk will end up in space and that'll end up jeopardizing future space missions. Yes, so um, each of the uh, satellites uh, we'll be putting up, uh, as you mentioned, every two years in the, our architecture, um, plan to be deorbited in five years. So as we're constantly, it'll seem like we're constantly, once we get our first and second tranche on orbit, uh, you're constantly seeing every two years satellites coming up and satellites coming down. So whether or not the satellite can last and function beyond that five years, it's scheduled to deorbit uh, safely um, once its mission cycle is over. So it'll have a maximum five-year lifespan uh, once it's on orbit and it's checked out and is actually operational. So that's how we're going to keep a proliferated architecture on orbit without getting satellites that are past their, uh, past their prime. And depending on which tranche we're looking at, um, pretty much, uh, potentially obsolete compared to what's on orbit. Like tranche one uh, will be uh, very impressive compared to when the end of the decade, when tranche three or a little farther, when tranche four satellites get on, tranche one will look like a dinosaur. So it doesn't need to be on orbit. It needs to be successfully de safely and successfully deorbited so the architecture, uh, so our NDSA can continue to proliferate uh, successfully and operationally without having useless uh, satellites that are no longer compatible with the latest technology on orbit. Great answer. Thank you. Other questions? Hi there. This is uh, Stian from Namonic, um, a Norwegian cybersecurity company. Um, I was wondering um, how will the U.S. collaborate with NATO member countries uh, when it comes to cybersecurity? Um, I think we need to work together to, to fight the adversaries. So I, I'll try to take this one under the, the Mar 4 Cyber. So um, we're, we're doing that now. Uh, U.S. Cyber Command, uh, uh, again, has multiple uh, um, arrangements, uh, um, partnerships, you know, globally. Uh, right now, leveraging, you know, whether it's uh, General Nakasone under his own authorities as uh, the global coordinator for cyberspace operations, um, but also through the combatant commands. 
So right now, um, you know, a lot of coordination by, with, and through uh, Commander for US UCOM as a particular example in, in those types of relationships. But again, it's a global. So, and it's something that we have to continue to do is, you know, so as I mentioned up front, and, and it's, it's all domains, right? It's, it's all domains in which the relationships between our allies and partners uh, are just becoming more and more important. And uh, the time to, to close any seams or gaps between those relationships is now. Great. Other questions? Did I see one over here? There we go. Good afternoon. Ken Christie from MITRE's National Security, FFRDC. Um, we've had a really good discussions in this panel on the, you know, the partnership between industry and defense and other discussions related to supply chain. And so I'm wondering what you think about with your software supply chain, especially as you get into such critical infrastructure as uh, space defense networks. I, I think one of the things that CASE is, is definitely focused on is the radiation harden of FPGAs. You know, we're no longer just in hardwired ASICs. You really need to be able, while you're up there, you need to, you know, you have a limited amount of, of power in space, right? So uh, whether we're using our, our solar array drives to help us, you know, if we're, if we're having to defend ourselves, uh, you know, to, then we're going to reduce some of our life. So one of the things that, that we really want to do is move towards these reprogrammable FPGA so that we can uh, relearn, uh, we can retrain, and then we can actually not just collect the data, but maybe even uh, given a new mission uh, through uh, new software uploads. I can tell you all, on, at least on the software company sides, we're, we're trying to recover our ability to be able to own our own chips. Um, that is a, a place that we got very, very far behind for, a, for, for you know, for decades, and now that's that's an area that the the uh, commercial uh, tech industry has actually really started to ramp up efforts to make sure that we can recover that. Our uh, American-made, you know, secure. We're looking at a lot of different types of technologies, working with glass and some other areas, which is it's really pretty exciting. So there's a ton of really interesting things taking place in chip technology today as well. Great. Okay. Hello, team. My name is Major Leip. I'm with the Joint Staff, J7. Part of our interests are uh, JADC2 and, and growing the, the next, uh, I guess, JD, you know, Joint All-Domain Officer. Part of, part of what I'm sitting here listening to, the flash to bang from uh, the capabilities emerging, the, you know, the new gadgets in response to the threats, but what about the doctrine piece to keep the Joint Force educated? Over. So I can... I'll take a, a swing at that first is, I mean, it is moving out and I tried to capture that um, sort of in the opening is, you know, we're not taking the years to, re to rewrite doctrine. There's, uh, at least on the Marine Corps side, you're seeing sort of the 85% solution is out on the street um, and we're moving forward and, and we'll uh, correct it or update it uh, over time or as new capabilities software uh, is produced and, and applicable. Uh, same in the schoolhouses. Uh, the Marine Corps schoolhouses are uh, incredibly dynamic and up, up to date, um, constantly updating their programs of instruction. And this is both officer uh, and enlisted. And the same same thing on on the uh, uh, on the training side. So there are lessons that are observed in, in current deployments. Those are immediately fed back into two lanes: really the capability development lane, and then lessons observed back into the training and education lane. And so it is, it is, um, it's a constant assessment and it's a constant feedback loop uh, that I think we're seeing across the service. Great. Okay, Damon. If I can add on to uh, that from, uh, from our perspective, um, we're looking at for, uh, for SDA, um, the transport lane being the backbone for JADC2. So what we have as part of SDA is a warfighter integration cell. And they, their task, um, obviously by, uh, uh, the cell's title is to work with the warfighter community, the services, the component commanders, the combatant commanders, the joint staff, to actually get their input as to how our satellites are going to work, how they're going to incorporate the, uh, the NDS NDSA, the transport and the tracking later, into how they plan to fight and how they plan to train. So you, we're looking at leveraging uh, their abilities, their, their knowledge from a combatant command and a service perspective to see how they can incorporate our technology into how they train and how they fight. And at the same time, our uh, 
biweekly outreach to the wharf landing community, um, understanding and over time developing um, that doctrine. So essentially, they'll see how we're actually going to be able to employ our satellite systems, how they're actually going to be fighting those, whether it's a con up and, and doctrine, and eventually trickling down to, to the schoolhouses, uh, to those major fleet exercises, those joint exercises, and even a, uh, a unit, a, a, um, um, even part of a, a carrier strike group or an uh, ARGME workup cycle, uh, be, part of the, um, be part of that training cycle. And that takes initially now working with the combatant commands and the services all the way down to once it's refined and once it's, uh, we have the con ops and we understand how our architectures work together, establish the doctrine so it is part of all the training cycles for these services, the Army, the Navy, uh, the Air Force, and the Marine Corps. And the, the major brings up a good point. It is, so it's, doctrine is all ranks, right? And, and that's the importance. So if we, if we start to, or if you continue to sort of stovepipe, you know, you, you use JADC2 as an example. Well, if that JADC2 just sits in your, your G6, your commos, you know, bucket, and hey, that's a, that's a G6 thing, then, then we've missed the boat, right? That's, that's a two, intel officers, your operations officers, your logistics officers, how are you gonna support it, your commos. I mean, all of that uh, integration is absolutely necessary from a doctrinal perspective, from you know, personnel and, and material um, to actually the capability. So. I love the, this kind of to, you know, dovetail off of what you just asked. The other thing that we, at least we're, the way we're kind of trying to look at it, so JADC2 makes my heart go pitter pat, because what it, it's you know, tons of disparate types of sensors. It looks like all kinds of like crazy different types of data sets to everybody else, but to the tech industry, it's ones and zeros. Um, the play that we typically try to look at those problems though is in the absence of having established and well-practiced doctrine, how can we make it easy? Um, and that's the one place where I think that the tech industry is actually really uniquely postured to be able to solve some of these problems because we look at them like ones and zeros. The question can be like, okay, what are you trying to accomplish? You're trying to use all these different sensor data. You wanna bring in some open source information. You wanna, are you trying to target? Okay, great. Um, a lot of times the warfighters just wanna be able to have some type of an analytic with all of the data coming in um, rather than having to like think about it and integrate a lot of different systems and so in some ways um, we kind of look at it as the um, doctrine, part of the doctrine problem is just making it easy for everyone to use the information that they're actually ingesting regardless of the type of sensor where it's coming from. And that's from the tactical level all the way to the strategic level. Um, if you can process it faster, make sense of it really, really fast, and you can get it to the tactical level all the way to the strategic level, then you know, you're starting to kind of like break down doctrine barriers in ways just because the information that you need is easy to use and easy to access. And interoperability being key. If we go back to one of your earlier questions about, you know, the the needs from commercial side, it is that it's got to be interoperable, right? At, from from fielding, right? So yeah. if if we're all part of we're all part of, fall under the umbrella of JAD C two and trying to fill out that kill web, you know, your your sensor, who knows who your sensor is going to be, and who knows who your shooter is going to be, right. and your shooter may change in the seconds that you referenced before, and so being able to yeah, you know, communicate. Absolutely. Okay, other questions? Great questions. Keep them coming. One over here. Um, I have a question you had brought up a little bit about hypersonics. Um, could you just briefly talk about the challenge of tracking? You had mentioned tracking earlier, intercepting them, and anything that we're learning from Russia's implementation in Ukraine. Um, so I will... Um respectfully pass on the last part, uh, keep myself out of trouble. Um, so for hypersonics, it's one of our uh, key missions, which is why we're implementing the, the tracking layer. The reason why we pick the uh, periphery low Earth orbit is so we can get the hypersonics, not just the initial flash, which can be seen by uh, uh, geosynchronous, uh, medium uh, Earth orbit and low Earth orbits, it's also when it's in flight in a, in when it's a little dimmer, a little harder to catch uh, from the medium and higher elevations or atmospheres beyond uh, what we're going at at about a, a thousand kilometers is where our tracking layer will be. So uh, the emphasis to be able to use that low Earth, low Earth orbit to detect the signals or the, uh, the OPIR signal um, from the hypersonic um, as well as be able to detect it with the potentially incredible amount of 
clutter in the, uh, the atmosphere that would uh, resemble a false positive. So we're actually not chasing, uh, you know, uh, phantom hypersonics. And then at that orbit, we can leverage the transport layer to, again, how I alluded to earlier, be able to get that data down to a fusion center and then over to a shooter as fast as, as possible. So we're leveraging the altitude that we're flying at, the ability from that altitude to see the hypersonic when it's uh, a little dimmer, uh, moving at great speed, as well as be able to leverage the rest of our architecture to get that, that, uh, that target track down to a shooter. Okay, other questions? Sweet. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Tom Skin. I'm studying at the National Intelligence University. Uh, and I had a question relating to uh, the space domain. I know there's a, a slew of anti-satellite weapons uh, uh, against the space domain, but I'm particularly interested in, uh, in non-kinetic, especially the, the cyber effects uh, against our space uh, systems. Uh, is this a, a credible threat? And, and what do we do about it, especially in terms of how our adversaries are restructuring their forces and, and kind of uh, and understand that, that we're, our military is heavily reliant uh, in the space domain uh, on our side. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll start with that one. So uh, go back first is on uh, you know, really the defense of your network and your capabilities. I think it starts there. Um, uh, and that's not only from a network or capability de uh, development perspective, but that's everything from to include physical security as well, um, as well as, you know, talk a lot about that's the biggest threat to the network is usually you know the 12 to 18 inches between the computer and the back of the chair um, and so that education piece uh, as well um, and then you have to have a deterrent I mean so um, I acknowledge the, the threat um, again I would talk about the network and, and uh, space capability hardening um, but the very similar uh, you know the US has to develop similar capabilities as part of that deterrent Other questions? Hi, Robert Cox from Pytech Solutions. I have a, just a general question. What do we learn from the Ukrainian experience of integrating Starlink capabilities with major weapon systems? In 45 days, they can actually have a command control structure sharing data information to target tanks and take them out. What have we learned? So, um, I'll try. I'll, I'll I'll tread. I'll tread lightly on it. Um, I would say lessons observed. Uh, I think it, it goes somewhat back to the uh, question we uh, uh, had before about you know what can you leverage from the commercial side, uh, their ability to scale, uh, commercial off the, sh the shelf, um, the ability to innovate uh, and and produce capability at low cost, and the integration. I think. Uh, from a, you know, a grunt's perspective, as a, I mean, you really have to be concerned about all domain warfare. Uh, everything from an individual taking a phone, you know, posting it on TikTok and it goes to the cloud, and now somebody's using that information, you know, to, to target or, or what have you seen in, in the news. I mean, those are concerns. I mean, you're seeing it play out today, but I would say those concerns have been around for the last five, 10 years. Um, so some things are just coming to light and, uh, and, and forcing us to focus on them. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to add to that too, as the, the, the emergence of open source intelligence, um, huge right now, you know, and it also, as, as much as, you know, we, we certainly have a relatively high reliance on classified information um, in a lot of different spaces, I think if we've learned, at least on the Microsoft side, with one of the things that we've learned a great deal is there is a ton of work to be done in the open source intelligence sharing, whether it's vetting the information or using it, but a lot of times some t you'll, you'll start to see uh, different anomalies start to pop up on social media that will give you an indication and warning that something bigger is coming somewhere else. Great. Jeff Berlet, Paraton Cyber Mission Sector. There's been a great deal of discussion today about JADC2, both in this session and other sessions. And I know the acquisition and the development and fielding, fielding of that solution is many years away. So my question is, what are the steps we're taking today to de-risk uh, that acquisition, 
that interoperability that we're looking to get in a future system? And also, are we developing common operating pictures and TTPs that will connect the DOD and the intelligence community? I'm happy to kind of start with that one. Um, at least on the, the technology side, the commercial technology side, knowing that JADC2 is coming down the pipe, most the tech industry is not waiting for the acquisition before we start to try to figure out different ways that we can integrate in sensors. And um, because we are also looking at, uh, we're, a lot of times we're having to use open source information like AIS data on ships and you know Maxar data for EOIR types of data. Um, a lot of uh, these companies were already starting to kind of figure out ways that we can integrate those data sets and then make it readily available and immediately available to the Department of Defense rather than just waiting for an acquisition to, to, to pop. Um, so I, I'd say that I think a lot of work is already being done in that space, but it's, it's literally in the name of like we need to do something. So if we wait for the acquisition cycle to play through, that's probably going to be too late. I would add, you know, the JADC2 implementation plan is out there. Um, I'm also responsible for, you know, secure, operate, and defend uh, the Marine Corps' enterprise network. And part of that is uh, what we're referring to as network modernization. And that network modernization is directly uh, tied to that implementation plan of JADC2. So as we're moving out in, in uh, future um, network development modernization, whether it's software, uh, or it's migrating to the cloud, um, th those steps are already um, underway. To your point on the, the COP, um, you know, on SHIP, I think that's, that, that's, that, that, that's a great comment and that's a great discussion point. Because again, under JADC2, if I go out to, the, if I use the Marine Corps exam, uh, example of, you know, if you have Marines on a ship forward deployed and they're inside that weapons engagement zone, right, and they are, what part of the kill chain are they reinforcing? What part of the kill chain are they? How are they reinforcing the entire kill web? Um, and that, you know, feeding back into a cop on a ship that may be a shooter, or feeding back into, a, I'll call it a cop on an F-35 that might be the shooter, and making sure that all of that uh, is, is uh, interconnected. Um, and then, obviously, I'll go back to the transport layer. This is about decision making and, and the data flow, so yeah. absolutely cr uh, critical part of that. That was a good question. Yeah. Damon, anything to add? Or? Um, I, th I think we hit on everything uh, related to that. Um, uh, just to add briefly, uh, when it comes to acquisitions and the speed at which uh, I agree it needs to be fast, looking at um, our, our tranche one, uh, the transport layer, which uh, by 2024, uh, it'll be up, and then once tested out, it starts to go with the interoperability with all the, the services. Uh, the key focus being that it will work with what the services already have, what the uh, the mocks, the operating centers uh, in the theaters already have. So um, be able to proliferate that quickly is, is incredibly important and in not actually using the traditional acquisition process. Uh, SDA has uh, modified it to, we have a capability, we're putting it on orbit and relying on the uh, the flag levels, uh, the warfighter council to say, yes, uh, go forth, and kind of bypassing the traditional lengthy process. So I think that uh, working well with uh, my colleagues up here have uh, uh, mentioned, I think that's how you get JADC2 operationally uh, faster. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Hello, my name is Daniel Moliano with uh, Naval Service Warfare Center, and my question is about the quality of sensor data collected by the satellites, um, more specifically regarding uh, the ad effects of adverse weather and atmosphere impacts um, on those uh, sensor data, and if there are any plans on how to mitigate that, especially regarding false positives and false negatives on uh, track recognitions such as hypersonics. I think that's one of those beautiful places where the tech industry can also be helpful. Um, when you think about, you know, if I've got a bad picture with an EOIR feed, um, what's better than layering that with SAR data? Um, you know, SAR data, weather doesn't matter. So, um, you know, you obviously there's other phenomena that you would have to worry about, you know, like sandstorms and other things like that. But um, 
but bringing in everything that you have and figuring out how to put those on top of each other, especially with some type of a predictable reliance on maybe you're tracking a target, the clouds roll through, um, you've got good SAR data that's able to kind of follow, like follow that target all the way, you know, you can ma maintain custody. Um, that's with a relatively uh, good predictability, that's, that's probably the place that we need to start looking at is figuring out ways like what works and what doesn't work and how can we start to put those different types of data sets together to paint a more holistic picture of what you're trying to get accomplished. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you bring up a very good point when it comes to being a, a collaborative effort. Um, first, uh, it's, it's that fusion. It's that layered fusion between not just what you're seeing on uh, that one satellite is what the global, uh, what the global picture looks like uh, focused on that one target. Uh, leveraging multiple ins and multiple multiple assets down to the that fusion center, that that targeting cell, and the decision makers as to what to do with that uh, threat or potential threat. Mm -hmm. um, for SDA, uh, that is why we're launching our Tranche Zero, our, our Warfighter Immersion. Uh, for tracking, it's exactly doing that it is working with the uh, with industry when it comes to false positives, when it comes to weather, inclement weather, uh, sandstorms, to identify what, uh, how the satellites will work and what potentially uh, gaps there are uh, looking at that tranche zero. And that will affect the, the, uh, what, um, what we will put on orbit for a tranche one for the tracking layer for those satellites. So fast lessons learned and, and, and most importantly, industry's ability to adapt while uh, that is in production uh, could be critical. Um, or it gets um, pushed on to the tranche two tracking layer um, uh, once it's uh, once it's funded and it's in uh, goes beyond planning to production phase. So that's how I think uh, our organization, SDA, working with uh, industry as well as defense partners, will be able to execute and mitigate uh, the challenges you presented as best we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. In the back. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Robert Stukes, PEOIWS. Um, I wanted to ask how satellites are being protected against directed energy weapons and uh, electronic attack, other mediums like that. Sorry to go Star Wars. <laughs> um, I can answer that in generalities um, uh, without going into any of uh, what our vulnerability, ass vulnerability assessments are. Um, that, I can answer your question without directly answering your question. Um, that is why we have a proliferated low earth orbit architecture, why we're putting up hundreds of satellites is to essentially, if a, whether it's a directed energy, uh, anti-satellite missile takes one out, you cannot uh, cost effectively take out 126 or potentially 400 um, uh, satellites. If you do, it would take you a while, particularly in a hot war where we, the, uh, the weapons that are shooting at our satellites, whether they're uh, kinetic or energy, are also targets for us. So I think that's one of the advantages we have with a low Earth orbit architecture, is a proliferated low Earth orbit architecture is we have too many uh, um, satellites for you to effectively uh, destroy or you know, render useless in a, over a, it'll take you a longer period of time than if we had just one exquisite or two exquisite satellites where if it's done, then we lost a major capability. Hopefully that's a very good non-answer to your question. <laughs> Other questions? I think we have time for one more. Oh, there we go. Um, you talked earlier about Global challenges need global answers. Um, and space junk has been a problem for three, four decades, and it's only gotten worse. In terms of uh, sharing data across nation, national state lines and across domains, um, what is uh, the focus on space junk cleaning up? So I think for, for SDA, uh, I have to allude to the, uh, the answer I gave earlier is uh, um, successfully deorbiting uh, our satellites so they do not become uh, space junk. That is our focus, uh, as well as making sure our satellites uh, 
uh, as our technology advances to not run into space junk and therefore become space junk. Um, so I think that's from our perspective uh, how we can be good stewards of uh, the uh, low Earth orbit altitudes that we're operating at. I think from a U.S. Spacecom perspective as a, as a component, uh, I would echo, you know, um, work that's being done with, with respect to uh, responsible behavior, um, but also really space domain awareness and developing those capabilities and improving those sensors uh, to be able to detect and then report, track all of that, uh, all of that debris that's up there. Um, you know, what Spacecom has put out already with the spacetrack.org would be a good example. Great. So we're out of time. Uh, you've been a great audience with lots of really good questions. Uh, thank you very much for that. So I want to thank the Navy League for putting this on, inviting us, and last but not least, if we could get our panelists a round of applause. Have a good rest of the exposition. Thank you.